People go missing all over the world every day, and it's up to investigators to figure out where they went or what happened to them. This is easier said than done, though, since many missing person investigations have very few clues to follow up on, and hence thousands of these cases remain unsolved. Number 10. In January of 2020, 40-year-old Dorothy Yates McCatherine, better known to her friends and family as Dottie, was living on a five-acre property in Vivian, Louisiana with her husband, Kevin. The couple had been married for seven years and had two children, a 14-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter, though the children lived with her mother, who'd been granted custody. Her daughter celebrated her sixth birthday on the 20th of January, but Dorothy was unable to make it to her mother's house for the event, something that greatly upset her. She phoned her mother that day and explained that she wanted to attend but couldn't find any transport. But she did promise that she would be there for the girl's birthday, which was to be held on the 26th. But then Dorothy simply vanished and her case continues to frustrate investigators as they've been unable to figure out what happened to her. The last time that she was seen was at her and Kevin's house on the 10,000 block of Vivian Airport Road. One certainty is that she was in the middle of cooking dinner since Kevin noticed when he got home from work on the afternoon of the 21st that there was okra cooking in a pot and a few peeves of okra lying on the counter where she'd been cutting them up. When he realized that Dorothy was nowhere to be found, he searched the house from top to bottom but couldn't locate her. But he did find her purse, driver's license, ID, and cell phone, but no further clues other than her car that was still parked in the driveway. Dorothy didn't show up to her daughter's party, as promised, and when she still hadn't returned to her house by the 27th, she was reported as missing. Searches of the large property were carried out with the aid of drones, search dogs, and officers on foot, resulting in some of her jewelry, a hat and scarf being found. Her cell phone records showed that she made a call to someone who's not been named on the 21st at 3.45 p.m. And her mother later stated that she told this person that she'd gotten into an argument with their husband and needed some time away. The friend also revealed that Dorothy had asked about a job at a restaurant that she'd previously turned down, and while on the call, she was interrupted by someone who entered the room that she was in, though it isn't known who that person was. They also stated that Dorothy had been crying, and when the person walked in, she quickly pulled herself together and could be heard greeting them with a simple hi. Theories as to what may have happened include that she left the house willingly with someone or that she simply left on her own and never returned. Investigators have not revealed whether they suspect foul play in the case, but the investigation is still ongoing. Dorothy's family describes her as having short brown hair, brown eyes, standing 5 foot 3 inches tall, and weighing around 110 pounds. She can also be identified by scars on her arms and a tattoo on her abdomen. Unfortunately, no one is certain what she was wearing when she disappeared. Anyone who has seen Dorothy or who knows where she may have gone is urged to contact Detective Matt Pergerson at 318-681-0708. Number 9. Michelle Dunlap Smith is a 51-year-old woman who's gone missing from LaGrange in Georgia and who's not been found to this day. Her last known location was at the Wellstar West Georgia Medical Center, where staff members saw her leaving at around 11 p.m. on the 26th of May, 2022 but she never returned and has not been seen since. The following day, after realizing that she had disappeared, her family opened a missing person report with the LaGrange Police Department. Her family explained to investigators that Michelle had been staying at the center as she was receiving treatment for alcohol withdrawal symptoms, and that she'd given no indication as to where she was headed. Realizing that she may be at risk given her condition, an investigation was immediately launched and the first order of business was to check CCTV surveillance footage from the center and the surrounding areas. At the center, they found footage of Michelle as she walked to the back of the building at 11 p.m., and it was quickly determined that she was not heading to her house since she was heading in the opposite direction. Other cameras in the area were also checked, but no further footage of Michelle was found, and investigators found it strange that she would choose to leave the center in the dead of night especially when she clearly didn't decide to go home. No further clues have been found in the case, and the police have urged members of the public to be on the lookout for her, since they would be relying on sightings of her to further their investigation. But they did state that they'd been contacted by several people who had either seen her or had theories as to where she may have gone, 
and all of these were followed up on without any positive results. It isn't known whether foul play was involved in her disappearance, but her sister has stated that she believes Michelle was abducted by someone, since it's out of character for her to head off on her own without informing anyone of her plans, or at least letting them know where she was headed. It was first thought that she'd simply decided to go home, since her house is situated close to the center. But since it was quickly determined that this wasn't the case, her family and investigators are concerned about her well-being. Michelle is described as having black hair and brown eyes. At the time of her disappearance, she weighed around 220 pounds and stood at 5 foot 4 inches tall. In the security footage that was obtained from the center, she can be seen wearing a light blue shirt, tie-dye shorts, and blue shoes. No further clues have been found, and Michelle remains missing two years after inexplicably going missing. Investigators have asked anyone with information on the case, or who knows where she may have been walking to that day, to contact Detective Amy Sweet at 706-883-2690. Number 8. At the time of her disappearance in October of 2017, Kelly Evans was a 54-year-old woman living in Enola, Arkansas. She was known to be somewhat of a loner, and those who were close to her describe her as an old soul. The last time that any of her family members heard from her was on the 14th of October, the day that she went missing, when she spoke to her daughter via text message. Her daughter would tell investigators that they'd been chatting that night, but that her mother's texts suddenly stopped without explanation, and she never heard from her again after that. When she still hadn't responded to any of her daughter's texts or calls a couple of days later, she went to Kelly's house to see what was going on. She searched for her mother upon arrival, but became concerned when she realized she wasn't there. Inside the house, it became apparent that Kelly had only taken her black and white striped purse with her, since all of her other personal possessions were still there. Her family stated that she would always keep in touch with them, and that if she had planned on going away, she would have notified them of her plans. Since this wasn't done, they started to worry that something might have happened to her, and a missing person case was filed. As soon as the investigation started, searchers combed the area for clues in a grid formation around Kelly's house, but this yielded no results. Then, exactly a week after she had disappeared, a witness contacted the police to report that they'd seen Kelly walking east on Highway 225. It seemed that she was walking towards a Greenbrier, and the witness stated that they were certain it was her, since she was seen carrying the black and white bag that was missing from her purse. Police officers immediately raced to the area where she'd been spotted, but by the time they arrived, the woman had already left and no one saw what direction she walked in. All that's known from this sighting is that she was wearing blue jeans and a hat. The case quickly went cold after that, since no further sightings were reported and no further clues were found. But in an effort to close the case, investigators carried out another search at Kelly's house in 2020 with the use of canine units, but once again, nothing of use was discovered. While it is uncertain where Kelly went or what happened after she was last seen, the authorities do not suspect foul play in the case, and they've urged members of the public who have any information to come forward. Kelly is described as standing between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 7 inches tall, she has red or auburn hair with green or gray eyes, and weighed between 125 and 130 pounds when she was last seen. She's also known to have a tattoo on her neck, another of barbed wire and a rose on her left shoulder, and one more of an orchid flower on her back. The last time that she was seen before she went missing, she was known to be wearing white shorts, a white tank top, and brown boots. She also likely still has her black and white purse with her. Kelly's case remains open, and anyone who has information on where she may be is asked to contact the Faulkner County Sheriff's Office at 501-450-4917, quoting case number 1700-5361. Kelly's name as case number is MP40417. Number 7. 43-year-old Gerald Sturegi, usually called Jerry, is known to be a keen and talented golfer. In 2002, he managed to achieve the 11th rank on the Wisconsin State Golf Association's Player of the Year points list and was set to play in a tournament on the 5th of October 2002. But he never had the chance to compete, since he inexplicably disappeared before the date of the tournament. While not perfecting his golf game, Jerry worked at the Dodge Correctional Facility, where he was a prison guard. 
He'd been working at the prison for more than 25 years, but according to his father, he became a changed man after a prison riot broke out in 1983. During the riot, he was captured and held hostage by some of the prisoners, and the incident had a lasting effect on him, with his family speculating that he may have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Unfortunately, he also had a history of driving under the influence of alcohol, and on the 15th of August, 2002, he was taken into custody for that offense for the fourth time. This resulted in Jerry having to attend a hearing, which would have taken place on the 12th of March, and he told a few of his friends that he was anxious about it, since he was worried that he may be dismissed from his job. On the 2nd of October of that year, Jerry worked a shift at the prison, after which he was seen leaving by fellow staff members. No one is certain what happened to him after that, as he failed to show up for the golf tournament. And when he didn't show up for his shift on the 8th of October, his father started to worry. His father had been trying to contact him by phone without success, and so he asked a police officer to accompany him to Jerry's house to see if he was there. When they arrived, they were surprised to find the apartment door unlocked and several lights turned on. In his bedroom, they found his cell phone on the bedside stand and noted that the TV was still on and tuned to a golf channel. None of his possessions seemed to be missing, since his keys, wallet, ID, and golf clubs were all accounted for. But they did notice that his firearm was missing. When his parking spot was checked, both his car and his bike were found, and neither showed any signs of being tampered with. His father reported him as missing two days later after not hearing from him. He told investigators that he last spoke to his son on the 23rd of September, when they'd had a phone call and, at the time, he had no reason to believe anything was wrong, since Jerry's demeanor seemed normal. His bank account has been monitored since he disappeared, but it's seen no activity. Search dogs attempted to track his movements after leaving his apartment, but were unable to find his scent outside. Several searches were conducted in different areas, but no sign of Jerry was ever found. Investigators have speculated that he simply might have decided to leave on his own, or that he may have met with foul play. But without any solid evidence, Jerry's fate remains uncertain. He's described as having brown hair and blue eyes, standing 6 foot 2 inches tall, and weighing 230 pounds. He usually has a short beard, and is known to wear a Seiko or Citizen watch. Anyone who spots Jerry, or who has any information on his case, should contact the Wapon Police Department at 920-324-7911. Jerry's NamUs case number is MP55794. Number 6. Jennifer or Jen Dominique Sullivan was 45 years old when she suddenly disappeared without a trace from New London in Connecticut on the 6th of January 2022. And to date, investigators are at a loss as to where she may be. Her family describes her as a kind-hearted and artistic person who has the uncanny ability to make those around her laugh. She was a very outgoing person who loved her children and had a 26-year-old son and an 18-year-old daughter. At the time, Jen worked for a paint company in New London. She was also in the midst of a rehabilitation program since she'd struggled with addiction in the past but was trying to turn over a new page. Her mother knew that she had a troubled past and told investigators that she would sometimes take her car without permission. On some of those occasions, her mother would have to resort to calling the police so that she could be tracked down and brought back home. She'd gone missing once in the past when she was 36 years old, but she and her chihuahua returned home soon after being reported missing. After disappearing this time, though, she was never heard from again. Her family would later tell investigators that staff at the rehab facility found out that she had relapsed and hence was asked to leave the property. She then phoned her daughter and told her what had happened, adding that she was either going to find another facility or just go home. She was in the habit of talking to her daughter and mother on the phone every day, and when she'd failed to make contact for about two weeks, they became concerned and contacted the Milford Police Department to report her as missing. Her bank accounts and phone activity were monitored for any unusual activity, but they've been silent ever since she vanished. It's also not been determined whether any of her possessions are missing from her house, or if she had any way of getting around other than walking. When no leads were found, and no one came forward with any leads, Jen's family contacted two private investigators in an attempt to track her down, and informed them that they believed her ex-boyfriend to somehow be involved in her disappearance. 
numerous searches have been conducted over the past two years, but have failed to produce any new leads, though investigators have stated that they don't believe any foul play was involved in the case. Jen is described as having strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. She stands 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighs around 150 pounds. She can also be identified by a Grateful Dead bear tattoo on her ankle and a tattoo of a fairy on her back. Unfortunately, it isn't known what Jin was wearing when she walked out of her house that day. While no new leads have been received, investigators have stated that Jin's case remains open and that any signs or leads that are received will be followed up on. They've urged members of the public to come forward if they have any helpful information or if they see her. Anyone with such information is urged to contact Detective Gallagher from the Milford Police Department by dialing 203-783-783. 4762. Number 5. In most missing person cases, investigators state that they don't suspect foul play, since many people simply disappear of their own accord. But that isn't the case with the 2023 disappearance of 41-year-old Nicole Baldwin. Nicole was married to Brett Baldwin, and the couple had three children together. The family was living in Mount Dora, Florida at the time that she disappeared, specifically in the area's Lancaster subdivision. Her family told investigators that she'd been struggling with anxiety and depression in the months before she vanished, and that she was taking specific types of medication to deal with these mental health issues. On November 1st of that year, Nicole attended her daughter's 20th birthday celebrations, and was last seen at her house by her daughter the next day, at around 11.30pm. Her daughter had no reason to suspect that anything was wrong since she seemed like her normal self. But she left the house that night wearing no shoes and just her nightgown and never returned. When she remained missing by the 5th of November, her family became concerned for her well-being and decided to file a missing person case with the Mount Dora Police Department. The first place to be searched was Nicole's house, and here investigators found her purse, bank cards, smartwatch, and her car. A pond behind her house was searched by police divers but failed to turn up any clues. Nicole's friends and family members conducted their own search of the woods near her house, but also failed to find anything useful. Shortly thereafter, authorities announced that Nicole's case was being treated as a homicide investigation, but they declined to say whether there were any suspects or why the case's status had been upgraded. As the case went cold, Brett decided to move away to Willwood, and in December of 2023, he was taken into custody on an unrelated charge. He had told his family and friends that he was planning to move to North Carolina, but was arrested before he had the chance. All efforts to locate Nicole have been in vain, and a $5,000 reward is being offered to anyone who comes forward with information leading to her being found. Her family has vowed to keep searching for her until they have some answers. Nicole has brownish blonde hair and hazel eyes. She stood 5 foot 5 inches tall at the time and weighed 135 pounds. She has several distinctive tattoos that may help in her being identified, including her children's names with three hearts on her right arm. Her left arm is covered in tattoos of flowers, and she has tattoos of a star and a scroll on her lower back, with the words, Live the life you love, love the life you live, on the right side of her back. The words, R.I.P. Mom, until we meet again, on her right thigh, and the word, Forever, with a heart on her right foot. If you or anyone you know has seen Nicole, or know where she might be, you're asked to contact the Mount Dora Police Department at 352-735-7130, quoting case number 23MD21651. Nicole's NamUs case number is MP112677. Number 4. When Darrell Robert Sims went missing in December of 2011, he was a 21-year-old man living in Detroit, Michigan. At the time, he was dating a woman with whom he had two children, a daughter and a son. His family believes that he was involved in an incident during which one of his friends was injured and had to be taken to the hospital, though they've not stated what the incident was or know how his friend ended up being injured. On the day that he went missing, the 11th of December 2011, Darrell asked his mother if he could borrow her car, since his friend was ready to be discharged from the hospital and he wanted to pick him up. She agreed and he left the house at 1 p.m. His mother waited for him to bring the car back after completing his chore, but she's not seen or heard from him since. When he failed to come home, 
His family contacted the hospital where Darrell's friend was being treated, and they were told that the man had already been discharged before Darrell even left the house to get him. A search of the surrounding area proved fruitless, and at first, investigators stated that Darrell was last seen on the 10th of December at the 5000 block of East Outer Drive, but they later changed this when it was found that he was seen at his friend's house the next day. It isn't known whether investigators spoke to the friend with whom he was last seen with, or whether that friend had any information on what could have happened to Darrell. It also isn't known whether this was the same friend who he'd planned to get from the hospital. The car that he had borrowed from his mother was eventually found abandoned at the intersection of Minnesota and Angling Streets, but the surrounding area contained no clues and Darrell remained missing. Crime Stoppers have announced that they're offering a $2,500 reward to anyone who provides investigators with information that leads to Darrell's case being solved. But to date, no further leads have been received. His family has stated that he's in the habit of keeping in touch with them, and they find it worrying that he's remained silent for so long. They've also asked members of the public to be on the lookout for the missing man. They describe Darrell as having black hair and blue eyes standing 5 foot 6 inches tall and weighing between 150 and 170 pounds. When he went missing, his hair was cut in a low-cut style and he had a goatee. They've also described his tattoos, the first being of the word loyalty on his face, another of the words fast cash on his knuckles, street king on his hands, blessed on his neck, and several other tattoos on his arms. He also has a small scar on his head. When Darrell was last seen, he was wearing a navy and gray Nike hoodie, a blue and white Detroit jacket, blue jeans, and a blue and white Detroit hat, as well as blue and white Air Max shoes. Darrell's family is desperate to find out where he is and ask that anyone who has information on his case come forward by contacting the Detroit Police Department at 313-596-2200. Number 3. Sabrina Long a woman who disappeared from Macon, Georgia, would be 52 years old today since she disappeared in February of 1991 when she was 19 years old, but to date her fate remains unknown. Sabrina was born in Memphis, Tennessee, but spent most of her childhood growing up in Macon. She attended Southwest High School and graduated in 1990. At the time of her vanishing, she was living with Charles Daniel Corley, her stepfather, as she'd moved out of her mother's house, which was located in southern Bibb County the previous year. She'd arranged to live with Charles on the condition that she contributed towards groceries for the house, and that she paid her own phone line. As long as she stuck to this agreement, she wouldn't have to pay rent. She was also holding down a steady job at a company called Bibb Manufacturing, where she was tasked with cutting up packaging labels that were used on boxes of linen that were to be shipped out to customers. She also had a boyfriend, a man named Scott Bradford. On the day of her disappearance, the 13th of February that year, Sabrina worked her shift at the company. She traveled there in Scott's car, a Camaro, since her own vehicle with a few issues couldn't be driven. When her shift was over, she got into Scott's car and drove to a house where she met up with him at around 11.30 p.m. He then got in the car and drove her to her stepfather's house, which was situated in Ashland Moore Drive. He then drove away and never saw Sabrina again. At home, Sabrina wrote a letter to Scott, stating that she couldn't wait to cook dinner, lasagna for him the next evening. The letter also made reference to the Arsenio Hall show that was shown that night from 11.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. During the time that the show was on, she contacted her mother, stating that she was planning on visiting Keith Daniel Lloyd, who lived across the street. He had asked her to pick out a birthday gift for his mother. Strangely, she asked her mother to call her back if she hadn't heard from her within the following 30 minutes, but her mother was close to falling asleep and stated that she probably wouldn't be able to. Her stepfather had gone out for the night as she was spending time with a few friends in Warner Robins, and when he got home at around 3 a.m., he couldn't find Sabrina anywhere in the house. This didn't cause him much concern since she was in the habit of staying over at Scott's house on occasion. But when she didn't show up for work the next day and failed to pick up her paycheck, her family started to worry and she was reported missing. The house was searched and in her bedroom, investigators found her purse, money, makeup, and work uniform. Her truck was still parked outside the house since it was faulty. She locked all the doors, but some of the lights in the house had been left on. During the ensuing investigation, 
a neighbor came forward to report that they'd heard a dull thud sound at around 1.30 a.m., but it isn't known whether this has any bearing on Sabrina's case, since there were no signs of a struggle taking place in the house. When Keith Lloyd, the friend who lived across from Sabrina, was questioned, he stated that they never had any plans to meet up that night. When asked about his mother's birthday present, he stated that it wasn't for another month and that he hadn't discussed it with Sabrina. He added that he and his girlfriend had been out that night and that they got home between 1 and 1.30 a.m. Keith was meant to be questioned again on the 25th of September, but this never happened since he ended his own life, leaving behind a note stating that he and a woman named Melinda McSwain were involved in Sabrina's disappearance. McSwain was arrested on the 18th of October, 2018 and she readily admitted to the charges against her. She also stated that several other people were involved, but this was later found to be a lie. She was ultimately released on a $100,000 bond, as the judge overseeing the case found several discrepancies in her confession and other problems with the investigation. She'll be under home confinement until her trial is heard. Sabrina is described as having brown hair and blue eyes, standing between 5'6 and 5'8 inches tall and weighing around 130 pounds. She was last seen dressed in a blue flower print dress and wearing a gold necklace. Anyone with information on Sabrina's case is urged to contact the Georgia Bureau of Investigation at 800-597-8477 or the Bibb County Sheriff's Office at 478-746-9441. Sabrina's name as case number is MP530. Number 2. Frankie Darlene Horsley has been missing from Fayetteville in North Carolina since the 10th of March, 1983, and her case remains under investigation as the authorities continue to look for clues as to her whereabouts. When she went missing, Frankie was 18 years old and had a son who was 18 months old. She spent her childhood being raised by her aunt and uncle since her mother passed away in a traffic accident when she was still very young. Then, on the 10th of March that year, she mysteriously disappeared. She had noticed that her son had a fever and so decided to go to a pharmacy for some medication. But she never came back home, was never seen by any of her friends and family again, and they were left baffled by her disappearance. When she still hadn't returned home four days later, a missing person investigation was opened at the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office, and a search was quickly organized. For the first seven days, no progress was made in the case, as no clues were found. But then, Frankie's car was found on Interstate 20 West. Frankie was nowhere to be seen, but the car was locked. When it was eventually opened, some of her clothes were found inside, but the keys were never recovered. Investigators have reported that they've spoken to someone who they believe has further knowledge of Frankie's disappearance but they declined to release their name since the case is being handled as an active homicide investigation. All that's known is that the authorities consider her disappearance to have taken place under suspicious circumstances, but no further details have ever been made public. Frankie is described as having brown hair and blue eyes. She weighed 125 pounds when she went missing and stood between 5'2 and 5'3 inches tall. Following her disappearance, her son was adopted by the same aunt and uncle who raised her, and he since stated that he knows his mother would never simply abandon him, since his remaining family told him that he was her whole world. He's also stated that he hopes to find out what happened to Frankie one day, since he's lived his whole life with more questions than answers. Investigators have stated that they find it hard to find any further evidence, since the people who were around when Frankie went missing have either passed away or were too young at the time to remember any important details that could close the case. Anyone who remembers anything about Frankie's disappearance, or who has any further information to share with investigators, is asked to contact the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office at 910-323-1500. Frankie's NamUs case number is MP13860. Number 1. Brianna Jade Hughes, also known to some by the nickname Winter, is a 32-year-old woman who inexplicably vanished from Pennsylvania in December of 2016 and who still remains missing. When she was still in school, she was a keen gymnast who competed at a national level, but when she was 16, she suffered a broken foot while training and to deal with the pain, she was prescribed painkillers. This had an adverse effect on her life 
as it resulted in her becoming addicted, and as time passed, she had several run-ins with the law as a result. Her mother stated that she started hanging out with the rough crowd, and that she on several occasions ended up spending time in jail. Her mother saw her for the last time on the day of her disappearance, the 15th of December, when Brianna arrived at her house to collect some clothes. They had a conversation, during which Brianna said that she was looking to find a rehab facility to book into, so that she could recover from her addiction. As Brianna left the house, her mother saw a red car parked outside, presumably waiting for her daughter. She described it as possibly being a Chevrolet Cavalier, with the heavy-set woman who had curly blonde hair sitting behind the wheel, though she didn't recognize her. Brianna then walked out of the house and got into the car, never to be seen or heard from again. Brianna's daughter was celebrating her 13th birthday in March of that year, and when she failed to contact her, her mother reported her as missing with the Upper Burrell Police Department. Searches of the immediate area were carried out without success, though it was speculated that she may have relocated to Pittsburgh following her disappearance, since she was seen on Frankstown Road and since her other child and the child's father were known to be living there, though this theory has never been proven. Witnesses also reported seeing her in Homewood in February of 2017, the year that she disappeared, but no further leads have ever been received, and Brianna's current whereabouts are unknown. Brianna is described as having brown hair, hazel eyes, standing 5 foot 2 inches tall, and weighing between 100 and 110 pounds. She has a tattoo of the word breathe on her chest, and may be going by the name Winter. Anyone who spots Brianna, or who knows where she may be, is asked to get in contact with the Upper Burrell Police Department at 724-335-0664 so that the case can be investigated further. Brianna's NamUs case number is MP42013. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.